if you can answer any of these questions then you figured out what happened with Madeline McCann. Hi guys and many thanks for joining me. If you are new to my channel, hi, I'm Kat and I like to talk about crimes, conspiracy theories and all sorts of related things. Please, please don't forget to make sure you hit the big red subscribe button below and also make sure you hit the notification bell so you are the first one to know about any new videos I upload. For my returning subscribers and viewers, I would like to thank you all so much for all your continuous support and all those lovely messages and comments I always read from you. This is what keeps me going. Thank you so much. As I uh, dissect through the Ocean Club's guest list at the time of Madeline's disappearance, I honestly find it more and more difficult to actually find enough information and it's, oh my god so frustrating really however i am trying to give you you know whatever info i find anyway as i've promised and also i'm asking myself how can it be that professionals such as doctors don't have any info online that's really strange anyway today i'm talking about robert naylor another interesting individual which shouldn't even be in a resort like the ocean club I mean, whatever, it's the same story as with the rest, I guess. But before we get started, here is the disclaimer. I do not mean to be disrespectful to anyone I talk about in this video. The video is for entertainment and educational purposes only. The information I collect is from the internet. I compile this information, I make a video, and from this you guys are more than welcome to draw your own conclusions. Thank you. But fun fact. Before we get into it, I just thought I should dump this on here, okay? Did you hear about CelebAgeWiki.com? Yeah, this is a website which gives details about celebrities, okay? Including their net worth. And guess what? Kate McCann is on there. She's a celebrity now. Yeah! And apparently Kate McCann's estimated net worth is between 1 million to 5 million dollars and the same goes for Jerry McCann, allegedly. I'm not saying that this is a fact, but this is what I found. The parents of a missing child have now celebrity status and millions net worth. I mean, this is fantastic, right? You lose a child and you become famous. Yeah. What are the odds of that happening? Anyway, going back to Naylor, Robert Naylor. In 2007, at the time of Madeline's disappearance, Robert Naylor worked in corporate finance for the corrupt Landsbanki. He worked for them in Edinburgh and later in London. Landsbanki was one of the largest Icelandic commercial banks which began to expand globally. IceSave was a deposit program for the UK market launched in October 2006. It became an instant success transforming Landsbanki's balance sheet and funding profile and since launched it grew rapidly and quickly became the market leader in internet deposit savings accounts in UK in terms of interest rates. On the 7th of October 2008 the IceSave UK website announced and I quote we are not currently processing any deposits or any withdrawal requests through our iSave internet accounts. We apologize for any inconvenience they may, this may cause our customers. We hope to provide you with more information shortly. End of quote. And iSave was declared in default on the 8th of October 2008, taking Landsbanki with it in its fall. On the day Landsbanki was nationalized, 174 million pounds were transferred to institutions owned or controlled by Thor Björfolsson and his father Björfol, who were the majority shareholders, however, they were not the directors of this. As Landsbanki collapsed, Robert Naylor and a few others jumped ship to form the Matrix Investment Bank, also in London. Robert joined Matrix in November 2008. He joined Theatre and Greenwood in October 2000 after qualifying with Ernest & Young in the Investment Management Department of the Financial Services Division. Robert has been involved in numerous PLC transactions including hostile and recommended takeover bids and primary and secondary equity fundraisings both, both in investment funds and smaller companies. 
Theatre and Greenwood became lands banky, which crashed, leaving many ordinary people out of their savings. Okay, quite boring, I hate the financial side of it. Okay, so, we need to take them one by one, okay? Theatre and Greenwood was taken over by Lands Monkey, and we know what happened with it. Ernest and Young Global Limited, known as Ernest and Young, or simply EY, is a multinational professional services network with headquarters in London, UK. It's considered one of the big four accounting firms. It primarily provides assurance, which includes financial audit, tax, consulting and advisory services to its clients. Like many of the larger accounting firms in recent years, Ernest & Young has expanded into markets adjacent to accounting, including strategy, operations, HR, technology and financial services consulting. Okay, I think that's it for the boring stuff. Now let's look at it in more detail. Mm. Oh, you know what I just realized? Look, this uh, this straw here, see, it's got a watermelon slice on it, which means that it's actually summer themed. But I was thinking, in all my smartness, is there such a word anyway as smartness? Never mind. If you, I'll show you. But now this this paper straw is actually stained with coffee. But I can show you. Look. Now it's a summer straw. You switch it around. Now it's a winter straw. You can just remove the watermelon slice from here because it's only glued, like the cheap stuff, okay? It becomes a Christmas straw, like the candy cane. See? Look at the pattern. There you go. This was all for my DIY mini video inside another video. Okay. I think this was the, the quickest DIY video in the whole world. Let's get back to it. The chairman CEO of Ernest and Young is Carmin Di Sibio. Carmin Di Sibio is an Italian-born American businessman who's been with Ernest and Young since the 80s. Di Sibio was elected global chairman and CEO elect for a four-year term on 17th of January 2019 and assumed the role of global chairman and CEO of Ernest and Young on the 1st of July 2019 succeeding Mark Weinberger, who served for six years. This Weinberger is actually not related to Paul Weinberger, which we talked about in a previous video. Following his studies at Case Western Reserve University, Mark Weinberger joined Ernest & Young Tax Department in 1987. Oh, the year I was born in. He later moved from the private sector to the public sector, becoming tax counsel for Senator John C. Danforth, a Republican from Missouri. He maintained that post through the early 1990s before becoming Chief of Staff for the 1994 Entitlement and Tax Reform Committee, which had considered raising the retirement age for Social Security recipients, increasing premiums for Medicare in the US and restricting tax deductions for interest on, on home mortgages. Please bear with me on this, okay? Don't get bored, don't go out, just wait a bit, have a bit of patience because I'm getting there. Weinberger co-founded Washington Council PC in 1996. Ernest & Young acquired the firm in May 2000. From then until February 2001, Weinberger ran Ernest & Young's National Tax Department. In late 2000 and early 2001, two US presidents tapped Weinberger to return to the public sector. In 2000, President Bill Clinton appointed Weinberger to the Social Security Advisory Board. Weinberger left Ernest & Young's National Tax Department in February 2001 to serve as President George Bush's Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Tax Policy. Weinberger then returned to Ernest & Young from the United States Treasury Department in April 2002. Weinberger also served President Obama on his Infrastructure Task Force. Ernest & Young announced in January 2012 that Weinberger would succeed retiring CEO Jim Turley by taking on the role of global chairman and CEO in July 2013. AT&T chairman and CEO Randall Stevenson named Weinberger chairman of the Business Roundtable Tax and Fiscal Policy Committee in December 2014. He served on the 2016-2019 on the Executive Committee. As President-elect, Donald Trump invited Weinberger and 15 other chief executives 
to join the President's Strategic and Policy Forum in December 2016, tasked with helping Trump establish an agenda that benefits the business community. In January 2019, Ernest & Young announced that Carmine DiCibio would succeed Mark Weinberger starting on the 1st of July 2019. Following this mandate at Ernest & Young, Weinberger joined the board of directors of several corporations including MetLife, Johnson & Johnson and, so and Saudi Aramco. Weinberger is also a member of the boards of directors for the National Bureau of Economic Research, Catalyst, American Council for Capital Formation, the Tax Council and and the Bullis School and the boards of trustees for Emory University and Case Western Reserve University. In June 2017, Mark Weinberger and Lady Lynn Forrester, the Rothschild, announced that they were bringing together CEOs from global companies, including Indra Nui, Paul Polman, and Jamie Dimon, to work on a proof of concept to encourage and measure companies' long-term value creation through human, physical, financial, and intellectual capital deployment. And we know who the Rothschilds are, don't we? But in case you didn't know, Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, Lady de Rothschild, is an American British businesswoman who is the chief executive officer of E.L. Rothschild, a holding company she owns with her third husband, Sir Evelyn Robert de Rothschild, a member of the Rothschild family, of course. The company manages investments in the Economist Group. Economist Group, okay, please pay attention. Owner of the Economist Magazine, Congressional Quarterly, and the Economist Intelligence Unit, E.L. Rothschild LP, a leading independent wealth management firm in the U.S., as well as real estate, agricultural, and food interests. She publicly supports many politicians, including Hillary Clinton. She rallies for a political movement called Inclusive Capitalism and led the Conference of Inclusive Capitalism in London in 2014 and 2015 and founded the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism. Now, I don't know if you remember or if you've seen, in my Julian Todman video, I was talking about the Economist Group, right? More specifically, Vivek Mutu, Todman's sister Marisa's husband, he was chief executive and founder member of Bazian Company, which analyzes medical research. He is an advisor to the Economist Intelligence Unit Healthcare. Okay, so you can't tell me that all these people are not related or connected to each other somehow. After selling Bazian in December 2007 and integrating it into the Economist Group to develop its global healthcare practice, he stepped into a non-executive role in 2015. The Economist Intelligence Unit, which acquired Bazian, is the Research and Analysis Division of Economist Group. Do you see now how this all connects? You know how it goes? I'll tell you, okay? Th the way I see it, okay? Whoever controls the food, water, pharmaceuticals, banks, and even air, they control the world, okay? They do. Because we eat the food we are given because we simply don't have a choice we have to survive so we eat what we can buy okay but do we really know the extent of what actually goes in our food we know meat is pumped with hormones right we see our children younger than ever seven eight nine ten years old hitting puberty going through hormonal changes developing much quicker than they used to and why do you think there is our air is, is so called purified by God knows what, we breathe that air because we need it. But do we really know what's in the air nowadays? We, need the, we also need the so called medicine to treat us, right? But do we really know if they indeed do so? But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here, isn't it? But okay. We know Mark Weinberger of Ernest & Young succeeded the retired CEO Jim Turley of Ernest & Young, right? We just covered that. Okay, so Jim Turley is an American business executive. He was chairman and chief executive officer of Ernest & Young from 2001 to 2013. 
He currently serves as the national president of the Boy Scouts of America. He's also a board member of Northrop Grumman, among others, which include Citibank. And I think we probably heard of Citibank before, isn't it? Northrop Grumman Corporation is an American global aerospace and defense technology company. In 2004, its subsidiary Scale Composites won the trophy for Spaceship One, the first privately financed, built and flown space vehicle. Without going into too much detail, the Northrop Grumman and its subsidiaries are developing bombers for defense technology and machinery for NASA. And UK subsidiaries, more specifically, Park Air Systems provides VHF and UHF ground-to-air communication systems for the civil and defense markets. Again, if you are still with me, and I'm really hoping you are, it might seem I'm way off track here, but please keep on watching because I'm telling you I'm not. Going back to Robert Naylor and his LinkedIn profile, from 2012 to 2016, he worked for Penmore Gordon. Now, the funny thing is, about Penmore Gordon. Apart from being a British corporate and institutional investment bank, the broker is known for its close connection with the family of David Cameron, the former British Prime Minister, whose father, grandfather and great-grandfather were all senior partners in the company, okay? David Cameron was a Prime Minister from 2010 to 2016 and we also know of his involvement with Operation Grange funding and Rebecca Brooks story. So, here we have another connection to everything else, okay? From 2016 to 2018, Robert Naylor was the Executive Director of JP Morgan Asset Management. Then he went back to being a Managing Director of Panmore Gordon what I just mentioned. JP Morgan Asset Management is a division of JP Morgan Chase and an asset manager for institutions, individuals and financial intermediaries. Assets can include equity, fixed income, cash liquidity, currency, real estate, infrastructure, hedge funds and private equity. JP Morgan Chase is an American multinational investment bank and financial services holding company headquartered in New York City. As a, as a bulge bracket bank, which means one of the biggest in the world, it is a major provider of various investment banking and financial services. It is one of America's big four banks, along with Bank of America, Citigroup and Wells Fargo. The big four, the big four, is the name given to the four main banks in several countries where the banking and industry is dominated by just four institutions. Then, Citibank is a part of Citigroup. Then, we know Jim Turley, who was the chief executive officer of Ernest & Young, where Robert Naylor worked for, is the board member of Citibank. So, all the financial institutions we just talked about are more or less the leaders of the world, right? Okay, so JP Morgan Chase has notable former employees, which is quite, quite interesting. Here we have Winthrop Aldrich, who was the US ambassador to the United Kingdom. Then Pierre Dannon, the chairman of Aircom, a large telecommunications and broadband company from Ireland. I'm not going to go through all of the rest of the important former employees, there are quite a few. I'm just going to mention the last one, which I think is important. <sighs> ah, oh boy, oh boy. David Rockefeller, a patriarch of the Rockefeller family, was also a former employee of JP Morgan. If you didn't know, the, Rockfe the Rockefeller family is an American industrial, political and banking family that owns one of the world's largest fortunes, okay? The fortune was made in the American petroleum industry duly, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries by John D. Rockefeller and his brother William Rockefeller, primarily through Standard Oil. The family had a long association with and control of Chase Manhattan Bank. 
by 1977, the Rockefellers were considered one of the most powerful families in American history. The Rockefeller family originated in Rhineland in Germany and family members moved to the New World in the early 18th century, while through Eliza Davison with family roots in Middlesex County, New Jersey, John D. Rockefeller and William Rockefeller Jr. and their descendants are also of Scotch-Irish ancestry. At present, Robert Naylor works for Chenko's Securities PLC. On Tweet Longer, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, I found some info from a user called Kiko Raton, who, as it seems, is ex-intelligence. Of course, there's no way I can verify this, but what he had to say seems quite interesting, and I'll quote. So far, the Naylor child was entered into the Ocean Club crèche six times in Jerry McCann's writing. Naylor didn't deny it when I spoke to him. Maddie goes missing, only cadaver order left behind. Should we connect these events? I say we should. I conclude that McCann took Elizabeth Naylor to crèche to enable him to take at the same time her then and now friend Madeline. This is a different Madeline we are talking about. I deduce that for respectability and practical purposes they would have been accompanied by a female, probably Madeline's mother, the other Madeline, not Kate McCann. Before we consider Madeline, the other one, a little background about Robert Naylor. His most recent CV since at least 2005 is as an investment banker, first with the corrupt and ultimately disgraced Lens Banky, with whom he worked in Edinburgh and later in London. As the bank collapsed, he and about a dozen others jumped ship to form the Matrix Investment Bank, also in London. But is there any evidence that he ever knew Jerry? No. Did he ever live or work near Rotley? Here it becomes interesting. I have seen and put in a safe place a copy of company's house form 288A dated 2002 on which a uh, Robert Naylor declares himself director or secretary of a small Leicestershire firm. This Robert Naylor gives his business address at Bradgate Hill, Groby. That's about four miles for, from Jerry's Golf Club, Rotley Park. Another mile from Rotley and about a further three miles from Quenneboro, where the McCanns previously lived. Is this our Robert Naylor? Only if we had his signature on a statement from PDL or from his current occupation would we know. And we haven't. But what we have got is Jerry's feeble attempt to replicate Naylor's initialized signature on the attendance records of the Ocean Club crèche. Given that he has never been acknowledged that the McCann's knew the Nailers, here is the only logical explanation I can offer for Jerry signing the Nailer child into Crescia. It started on the first morning, 29th of April, 2007. So they must have had a prior arrangement. Jerry needs to start his sequence of signing in because he has to impose on the staff the unshakable belief that the child entered as Madeline McCann is really and truly his daughter. They will always swear that it's so because they will never know any difference, right? But why should he have to go to the length of signing in with her, a child from London whose connection with the McCanns is still kept secret? Because Madeline, the other Madeline, was and is the very close friend and possibly cousin of Elizabeth Naylor. They are in PDL on holiday together. They don't go to crèche every session together like twins joined at the hip. Stuff happens like a short fever or a tantrum or an unmissable outing, but they are there together seven times out of ten. That's according to the crèche records, although I believe that on two of those occasions Jerry manufactured the presence of Madeline, Madeline, Madeline McCann and the other Madeline, who I su suspect did not turn up that day on the 1st of May. Elizabeth and Madeline, the other Madeline, live close together in a fairly privileged part of London. They go to the same primary school and can even now often be seen together. Note, not by me, open and available source. Logic tells me that Jerry would not have risked being known as the man 
who alone took two girls to Crochet, particularly as one of them in theory is to become known all over the world. For this reason, I believe Jerry had female company in the attendance book process. And logic goes on to say that this female would probably have been Madeline's mother, the other Madeline, end of quote. I'm not sure what to make of this. Uh, a lot of what um, this uh, person is saying makes sense. I try, I actually, uh, I'm, I couldn't find the, the business that uh, this person was mentioning when they, they wrote this uh, post. I looked on company's house, but I couldn't really find any details. And also he didn't uh, add whatever he was saving as proof. As I said, I can't exactly verify this information. However, I have added the crochet signing papers from the PJ files. Now though, I have some stuff I need to say, okay? I really do. I really, really do. Like usually, anyway. How can a bunch of doctors be connected directly or indirectly with the most influential people in the world? Like the Rothschild family, the Agnelli family, the Rockefeller, and as you'll see in my next video, the Oppenheimer family. I find it close to impossible. So what if they are doctors? So many people are doctors, but there are no other connections with such influential, influential people. So we cannot entertain the possibility of their profession as a base. In my opinion, it just doesn't work. So then, there must be a common scheme, right? A common purpose to all of this. And then, there are so many people asking if the MI6 or MI5 was really involved in the cover-up of Madeline's disappearance, then why didn't they kill the McCanns or make them disappear? We A good question, which I've been asking myself as well, to be honest. And can it be because the McCanns are still needed in the bigger scheme of things? Or because it would be too obvious otherwise? A child disappears and then the parents are killed? Mm. I don't quite see that as a viable option, if I'm honest. And then... How can a bunch of doctors be connected directly or indirectly to the biggest investment organizations and banks in the world? Also, is Operation Grange investigation and funding the payment to keep the McCann's and the group quiet? Something which was promised to them in exchange for their silence? What if the investigation is still open because perhaps if there is a freedom of information request which we know has happened over the years they can justify their unwillingness to reply with matters of national security but then if the investigation is closed this reply doesn't apply anymore and records become public when there's a national security response to a request does it mean mi5 MI6, secret services and so on are somehow involved, is it possible that MI6 are the so-called cleaners? Can it really be a matter of defense? Or, as an example, why, why is Porton Down working for an anthrax vaccine for a US company when there's no anthrax? Working for the vaccine would mean they have the virus, right? Can it have something to do with uh, perhaps biological weapons, biological war? And all of this would go back to world domination, the new world order. If you can answer any of these questions, then you figured out what happened with Madeleine McCann. And that's all from me for today guys. Thank you so much for watching the video. Before you go, can I please remind you I've put together a gift, uh, a Christmas gift ideas list from Amazon and the link for that is in the description below. I put it together for you so you don't have to scroll tens of thousands of Amazon pages to buy the perfect gift. If you want to have a look at it, the link is in the description below. That is not my shop, but as an Amazon influencer, any purchase made through my link will earn me a 10% commission. Again, thank you so much for watching and thank you all so much for all your support. 
please don't forget if you learned something from this video and you have not subscribed to my channel please make sure you hit the big red subscribe button below and also make sure you hit the notification bell so you are the first one to know about any new video i upload thank you again for watching take care stay safe bye bye